summarize this presentation in terms of empirical evidence. I want to show how the existing research tells us something about the very basic organizational principles of social interaction. So, for instance, turn-taking. It's something extremely basic. It's everywhere. The second fundamental um, feature of social organization in social interaction is repair. Right? We, we have this ability to shoot trouble online while speaking. Sequence organization has to do with how we build things in blocks, like we, how we open a story, how do we close a, uh, a conversation, these larger blocks of, of social action. And preference organization has more to do with how a next turn relates to a preceding turn, right? So preference organization, the standard example, I will come back to that, of preference organization is when I uh, do an assessment, for instance, how does the second person react? When I say, oh, it's a gorgeous day today, the preferred reaction would be, yes, you're right, it's a fabulous day. The this preferred reaction would be, well, I don't know, right? So. And we, I guess we can all agree that these are very, very fundamental uh, building blocks of social interaction. First point, turn-taking organization. Tanya Stivers and colleagues have looked at turn-taking organization across 10 very distinct typologically distinct languages. And they say there are striking universals in the underlying pattern of response latency in conversation. What they mean by response latency is timing. So in CA, in conversation analysis, we call that minimization in ga of gap on overlap. So we know that usually conversation rolls quite smoothly. There's very few overlap, very few gaps. This is why in everyday conversation, we realize, when, I realize when you cut me off, and sometimes I say, hey, guy, you just cut me off, right? Th why do we realize that? Because normally we change uh, turns that talk quite smoothly. So what happens when we move in a second language? The study I'm going to present is, a, is, is an older study. It has been carried out 10 years ago by Asta Cekaite uh, in Sweden. Asta had looked at a seven-year-old Kurdish immigrant child. Her name is Fusi in a Swedish classroom. It's actually kindergarten. So Fusi had just arrived um, in, in, in Sweden. She was a beginning second language speaker and the study uh, was carried out over a period of one year. And so Chikaida was interested, is there any change in how that child engages in a classroom turn-taking? The results, and I will show you examples, are the following. In the first phase, the, uh, the child Fusi just remains silent, so non-participative. I'm sure you know that from your classrooms, right? In a second phase, she resorts to what Chikaita calls disruptive turn-taking. She uses loud voice or n calling names to, to get attention, so heavy attention-getting devices. And only towards the end of the year does uh, Fusi develop more smooth, more locally appropriate techniques for turn-taking. Fusi comes in at moments that are perfectly appropriate for turn-taking, namely um, after, after full sentences, full turns, reaching uh, you know, final intonation. This means final intonations. Further interesting observations are that not only she takes the turn, but from the onset she shows, oh, what I'm going to say is relevant to the topic that we've just been uh, discussing. And this is interesting because in conversation analysis, uh, Gail Jefferson has shown that when we take a turn and we we signal that this is topically related in terms of contents related to what has been preceding, then there is less risk or of us being interrupted than when we don't signal that in the start of the turn. So I think the take home message is that there is change even in such basic things as turn taking. So we don't just transfer turn taking from the first language, we recalibrate it. And then I think that this is also important. 
what the change leads to is, is to some kind of more locally, that means interactionally efficient and acceptable conduct. Sequence organization. So I said sequence organization has to do with how people package things in bigger uh, ensembles. And this is important, right? I mean, when we navigate to a conversation, it's important to signal to each other, OK, now I'm going to, for instance, start telling a long story. One, one, one basic mechanism for telling a story is suspending the turn taking. I can't get a story in if we continue turn taking, right? So. There is some kind of work we need to do in order to signal to each other what's the next thing we're going to do. St and that has to do with sequence organization. So how do we package things in, in larger units? Kendrick has says, had said something like sequence organization is a universal infrastructure for action. Think of, again, think of, uh, for instance, opening a conversation. There are very, telephone conversation. There's extremely distinct sequences. There's the greeting sequence, and then there is the uh, um, mutual recognition sequence, and then there is the first topic, the first content sequence. You know, it starts, hi, hi, um, this is the, 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 the calling. Oh, yeah, hey, I, I'm, I'm Sarah. And only then do we move into, and we know that these are these kind of building blocks, so sequence organization. In this study, we looked at a story opening. How do people, out of the basic mechanisms of turn taking, suddenly manage to get the floor for a lengthy telling? In this study, we looked at a French au pair girl. Uh, she's she's uh, staying with a host family in the French speaking part of Switzerland. Her first language was German, and she had followed. 12 years of French instruction in school before, in the public school system, you know, secondary school. At the uh, time of arrival, she's, I think, about 17 years old. So 12 years of schooling. She's an advanced speaker of French. She's been uh, rated um, B2 according to the uh, Common European Framework of Reference. So she's an advanced, intermediate un until advanced speaker, right? So the data is 20 hours longi longitudinal across nine months, staying with the au pair family. We see uh, the girl who's called Julie move from advanced to more advanced. We have a collection of 28 storytelling. So this is all collection based. That's important, right? We don't look at one interaction and then another. We have these, you know, recurrent. We look at regularities. And you will see, and I'll illustrate that, in terms of development, we have something like, in the start, she only minimally indicates, oh, what I'm going to do now is tell a story. I call that minimal projection of story and minimal fitting into ongoing talk. What I mean by that is when we open a story, we have to, A, suspend the turn-taking machinery, right? We need to get a lengthy turn in. That means I need to signal, oh, OK, now it's, I, I have to have the floor. Then B, in order to have the floor, I need to make sure that you understand that what I'm going to tell is relevant. I can make that by saying, oh, you know, a funny thing happened. I can make it by, you know, it's really sad, but whatever I do, I use techniques for making what I'm going to say relevant, right? I, I project some aspects of the telling. And also, typically, I fit, I signal how what, what is coming up is going to be fitted to what we've just been talking about. So I might go, oh, this reminds me. Or I might go, oh, talking about John. You know, so otherwise, if I don't do all this work, either I don't get a longer f floor, or I uh, disrupt the conversation. You know, storytellings might come in, in medias res, bang, and it sounds very disruptive. So essentially, to put it down in very simple words, Julie's stories in the start come in in medias res, are disrupting, and then they come in much more smoothly. If we sum just these findings on the story opening um, up, again, this is a learner that had had 12 years of school instruction before going into the wild, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of sequential placement, yes, 
the stories are placed from the onset, right? You know, after some kind of closing of a preceding sequence, they don't interrupt a turn. In terms of projecting a telling, well, very minimally in the start, we saw only the use of past tense or adverbials. But then we have a lot of things that were not present in the initial months, but that start to be present in the latter months, like securing recipiency and reference availability, securing the fact that you are ready to attend and uh, that you understand who I'm talking about. Remember all these things she says about the girl who works at the kiosk and so on. Displaying relation, relation to prior talk, fittedness, right? Signaling, yes, I'm talking about the job that you just mentioned. Projecting features of the nature of the telling. For instance, anticipating how this is going to be uh, attended to by the recipient by means of the me, the but. She signals, oh, this is going to be a telling that's going to go into another direction than what you just said. So, interestingly, what we see here is a diversification of methods, right? She diversifies her means for opening a story. And thereby she kind of makes this story relevant, tailored, better tailored to the precise people she's talking to, and better fitted to be attended to by these people. Preference organization has to do with the fact that when I invite someone, people tend to say yes, accept the invitation. If they don't accept the invitation, they signal some, they kind of use more material. It is, they kind of push the dispreferred reaction back into turn, right? You want to go out and have a coffee? Sure. You want to go out and have a coffee? Well, I'm sorry, but okay. So when we um, produce preferred next actions, we tend to produce them straightforward at the start of the turn. When we produce this preferred next action, we tend to push them back and kind of moderate them by first displaying, oh yeah, but, right? Same with agreements or disagreements. Um, I love Julie's sweater. You go, yes, it's gorgeous. But you don't go, no, it's horrible. You tend to go, well, it's not bad, but you know, it's a bit large for her or something like that. Okay, so that's what we routinely do. We tend to push this preferred responses further back in the turn. Sachs has said that uh, preference organization is a formal apparatus, so what we tend to do has not to do with what we prefer, like personal liking or psychological states, rather what we routinely do in conversation. This is a study that we conducted on classroom. We looked at, it's a cross-sectional study, so this is not longitudinal. We had um, 10 hours of classroom interaction at 8th grade. So that, that's uh, lower secondary, right? And then we had 10 hours of uh, 12th grade. Only conversation lessons, no, no grammar exercises and so on. And we looked at disagreements. What we will see in terms of development is that at a lower secondary level, where we have, let's say, intermediate students of French, they use no as a standard response. Just someone says, you know, let, let's bring uh, hip hop music to the party, and the other person says, goes, no, right? <laughs> and and uh, so this would be a dispreferred way of doing that, right? It's the unusual way. And then with time, uh, they students, these students develop what we call dispreferred action formats. That means they shape their action, as I said before, in two parts, saying first yes and then but. Right? It's a yes but shade response. It's not a straightforward disagreement. It's going alignment and then disalignment. And again, I'm not saying this is a good way of doing it and the other is a bad way of doing it. All I'm saying is that this is the routine way of how first language speakers do disagreement. We first display alignment and then disalignment and that smoothens down. So this is interesting because of course this is about interactional competence, but it's a lot about maintaining intersubjectivity, right? Face preserving actions, sequentially organizing uh, actions in a way that is more face preserving. Look at this. So, 
pol polarity markers between the lower and the upper secondary. Pol polarity markers are these yes or no responses. I mean, you can use yes in a disagreement, right? Mm -hmm. When I say he didn't go to, to, to Paris, and you say yes. Okay, so that's, that would be a disagreeing marker. So polarity markers, the kind of no or yes or disagreement, they significantly decrease between the lower and the upper secondary. They don't disappear, but they significantly decrease. And these yes but forms emerge. There was 0% uh, at the lower secondary, and we had 17% of the disagreements formatted like this. In other words, speakers' methods or systematic procedures of doing disagreement diversify. What is interesting when they diversify? Well, they are able to adapt more to their interlocutors. Of course, we all know that sometimes we disagree by saying no. We might do that with our boyfriend, girlfriend, or we might do it with our, you know, I don't know, close friends, but we typically don't do it with people like, you know, my university professor or something like that, right? So if we have different ways of doing something, it means we are much more able to adapt to other people around us and to the local constraints of social interaction. So what's the cumulative evidence? What do we see across these studies? Is there anything that's common through them? I want to um, point out some of these common tendencies throughout these studies. And one of the clear common tendency is diversification of methods, diversification of procedures of doing things. People, when they move into their second language, the more they advance, the more they diversify their ways of taking a turn, of opening a story, or of disagreeing. That's the first point. Second point, we've just seen that. This diversification is important because it allows for increased, and I'm sorry for again this technical term, increased context sensitive conduct. It means essentially increased ability to adapt to the local circumstances of talk. And then also we've seen, especially maybe with the story opening and maybe also with the disagreeing, increased ability for what is called recipient design, which means tuning what I'm saying and what I'm doing exactly to you, right? So diversification of methods allowing essentially to be much more socially sensitive.